Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce another crisis mapper. Um, Patrick Meyer is a crisis mapper and currently the Director of Social and Humanitarian Innovation at the Qatar Computing Research Institute. He's an internationally recognised thought leader in this area. Uh, he's an author of the book Digital Humanitarians, How Big Data is Changing the Face of Humanitarian Action. He has a long list of commendations from all over the world. He's on the innovation team of the United Nations Secretary General's World Humanitarian Summit. He's been awarded a number of fellowships, the UNICEF Humanitarian Innovations Fellow, Rockefeller Foundation Fellow and Pop Tech Fellow. He has an incredibly popular blog, iRevolutions. If you haven't had a look, it's got more than 1.5 million hits. I could talk and talk about Patrick, but I think we'd rather hear from him. So, without any further ado, would you please welcome Patrick Meyer. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and um, thank you so much to, to Tim and the entire organizing team for, oops, uh, I'm good at getting ahead of myself, the organizing team for kindly inviting me to speak on this panel. It's a real treat and, and pleasure to be uh, sharing the stage with uh, both Lee and, and Axel. So I'll jump straight into it, and uh, Lee beat me to this phenomenal animation. This is really crowdsourcing in uh, action in Nepal after the devastating earthquake. Basically, thousands of digital volunteers from all around the world mobilized online to trace, um, well, over 10,000 miles of new roads, as well as over 100,000 um, new buildings in, in just a matter of days. I mean, it's truly outstanding, incredible, incredible work. Now, where did these digital volunteers come from? They came from the humanitarian OpenStreetMap community that are members of the Digital Humanitarian Network. This is a network that I co-founded with the United Nations a few years ago in order to uh, accelerate self-organization after major disasters. And why do I talk about self-organization? Well, because in many ways, resilience is the capacity to self-organize and to bounce back after major disasters. And so this capacity is really pivotal to enabling real-time, accelerated, and integrated action in response to new humanitarian challenges around the world, such as climate change. But not only the kind of climate change that you're probably thinking about right now, but also a radical change in our data climate. It used to be uh, several years ago that we in the humanitarian space used to face a, a barren information landscape where the main challenge was not having enough information to understand who'd been affected, how badly, where, for weeks sometimes, if not longer. Increasingly, however, we find ourselves in a very different uh, data climate, one that's characterized by total data overload, the so-called big data, and that gets generated during disasters in the form of satellite imagery and of social media and, and other data sources. And what humanitarian organizations have found is that um, while they're very ill-equipped to make sense of this vast volume of information, which is precisely why the digital humanitarian network exists, it's why digital humanitarians like OpenStreetMap have basically fill the void um, to basically provide the search capacity, the self-organized search capacity to humanitarian organizations to make sense of this big data. I want to talk about uh, Nepal. The UN activated the digital humanitarian network within hours of the earthquake uh, striking. And in addition to asking for satellite imagery support in the ways that uh, humanitarian open street map uh, deployed, they also asked um, digital humanitarians to make sense of social media information. In particular, identify tweets uh, that refer to urgent needs, not three weeks or three days after the tweet was posted, but basically in near real time. They also needed to know um, what pictures were out there on social media and mainstream media that showed disaster damage so that they could do a very rapid, uh, quick and dirty, but, but very quick um, disaster damage assessment. So digital humanitarians used a platform, a free and open source platform called Micromappers that my team and I have been developing in partnership with the UN. And the purpose of Micromappers is to basically combine crowdsourcing with artificial intelligence to make sense of different types of data that get generated during disasters, such as text-based information, tweets, SMS, pictures, um, Instagram, YouTube videos, imagery, both satellite imagery and aerial imagery. And the reason why we've moved beyond just crowdsourcing is because uh, we think that crowdsourcing alone is, is really not going to win the big data battle. Uh, in order to really have a scalable solution to making sense of big data, 
we need to combine human computing, i.e. crowdsourcing, with artificial intelligence. And I'll show you how that actually works. And so it's often fun to tell humanitarian colleagues of mine that you know, the UN is using artificial intelligence. It sounds like science fiction, but it's actually been happening for the past couple of years. So if you were a digital humanitarian in the aftermath of the uh, earthquake in Nepal, and you mobilized online uh, it, on micromappers, this is what you would see. This is a screenshot of what you would see as a digital humanitarian. And you're simply asked to classify uh, the tweet according to the, the category that best fits. Uh, and this, these categories, these information needs, are not those that we have in terms of digital humanitarians. We didn't come up with those. Those come straight from the UN. These are their key information needs within the first 24 to 72 hours after a disaster. Now, it's all fine and well to be doing this, but again, does it really scale when you're talking about millions and millions of tweets? And even if you did have a million volunteers, is that really the best use of human time if we have an alternative, such as using artificial intelligence? And this is where another uh, platform that my team and I have been developing uh, comes in, ADR, A-I-D-R, which stands for Artificial Intelligence for Disaster Response. And you can think of ADR as a smart machine learning engine that sits behind micromappers. And as volunteers are tagging and classifying these tweets, it just simply learns to recognize which tweet is being put in which bucket and identifies certain, uh, certain characteristics of these tweets. It uses a technique from AI called statistical machine learning to do this in real time. And once it's learned enough, can automatically tag up to two million tweets or text messages uh, per hour. And it'll tell you the confidence level. It'll tell you I'm 70% sure or 90% sure. And every time Ader is 70% or less sure that it's automatically tagged a tweet correctly, we take that tweet and we push it right back to, to the crowd in order to basically continue learning. So it's a win-win. The more the crowd interacts with micromappers, the more intelligent the Ader platform gets. I mentioned pictures as well. And so obviously a picture speaks a thousand words and being able to visualize disaster damage and assess how much damage you see in a picture is really useful for humanitarians and not just obviously the UN but also development groups that do post-disaster needs assessments like the World Bank. This is just an animation of what micromappers looks like when you're doing a tagging of pictures. And this is, uh, these pictures are not actually from, um, from Nepal, but just to give you an illustration, this is what you would see. And it's, it's fairly simple, right? If you can click like on a Facebook picture, you can be a digital humanitarian. And what we do is we show every picture to at least five different volunteers. And we do these, this with tweets as well. We show every tweet to at least five different volunteers in order to triangulate, in order to ensure data quality control. Uh, so that only if, say, five out of five or four out of five of digital volunteers uh, say that this is a picture with severe damage, do we take that and we go ahead and map it. Now again, this could be fun maybe for the first few minutes if you were to get into it, maybe an hour, but it's not going to scale on its own, which is why we're basically exploring some computer vision, advanced computer vision techniques, teaching algorithms to recognize what a picture with disaster damage looks like. Um, this is actually not entirely science fiction. It's not easy, but it can absolutely be done and something we're actively working on as well. That way we can automatically identify uh, pictures with damage in the future. And all these, this content, the filtered relevant content ends up on a map, not just because we like maps and maps are pretty, but because when you start mapping information, you make it actionable. Telling the UN that there's a destroyed bridge in Kathmandu is completely useless. Where in Kathmandu? Uh, you can't respond if you don't have that kind of geographical uh, information. Now, these maps, these crisis maps, I mean, just like with, with OpenStreetMap, would be completely empty if it weren't for the fact that people cared. That literally thousands and thousands of digital volunteers, in the case of micromappers, in 87 countries around the world mobilized to support relief efforts online in Nepal, just thousands of miles away. You know, they would never necessarily meet people in Nepal, but here they are getting online and spending time clicking uh, through these tweets and these pictures to support uh, relief efforts. So what this really shows is that spatial information really enables uh, unprecedented collaboration and action in the digital space. Now we've talked about space-based sensors uh, from satellite imagery. We've talked about ground-based sensors, mobile phones, and so on. What about in between? What about aerial sensors? This is um, aerial UAV drone footage after Typhoon Haiyan. And I was seconded to the UN uh, after the, the uh, typhoon in order to support their relief efforts on the information management side. And I was really struck by the number of different uh, UAVs that were flying. In the case of Haiti, we had one or two, but they're huge ones. 
And here we have uh, half a dozen micro UAVs uh, being used. And this data is really not going to shrink anytime soon if you start looking at the industry's st uh, statistics. This year alone, uh, well over 4 million consumer uh, uh, commercial drones are, are going to be sold. And so uh, that's the ones we really know about in terms of the, the fancy ones that, like these that were used uh, in response to the Nepal earthquake. But what about, I would say, the, the informal drones, uh, like this one, and that was built a few months ago by a community in Ghana, West Africa, for a development project. In fact, you can go from, Guyana, from Ghana all the way to Guyana, to the rainforest of Guyana, where a local indigenous community, the Wapichanas, uh, have been basically building their old, own drones um, out of uh, spare parts and um, lots of glue and so on. And this is just some a video footage of their very first uh, flight again a couple of months ago. You can see uh, innovation is not always easy. Right? Um, but why, why are they flying or, or working so hard on, on building these drones? Well, because there's illegal deforestation and illegal mining happen in their own rainforests. And this is a picture they sent me just a couple of weeks ago of an illegal mine. So they're taking matters into their own hands. They're not using a fancy DJI quadcopter that costs a thousand bucks or two thousand dollars. They're building their own and taking matters into their own hands. So unlike satellites, UAVs have far more of a democratizing uh, um, uh, phenomenon to them. People can own them and use them for their own purposes. And that's really important in terms of, of self-organization. In Haiti, Port-au-Prince, the best you know, UAV pilots in the Caribbean uh, actually come from Haiti. This is a local team of Haitians since 2012 who are flying their own UAVs for disaster risk reduction, disaster preparedness, and disaster response. And so when we think about Hurricane Sandy, at least when Americans think about Hurricane Sandy, they think about New York. But the fact of the matter is Sandy went right through Haiti. And within 24 hours, thanks to this local team of Haitians, the international humanitarian community, as well as the Haitian government, had access to not only aerial imagery of the affected areas, but analysis of this aerial imagery entirely conducted um, by this uh, Haitian team in collaboration with uh, IOM, the International Organization for Migration. Meanwhile, in uh, Indonesia, Jakarta, obviously a very uh, highly flood-prone country. Some colleagues of mine are working with the, uh, the Jakarta's Disaster Management Agency to crowdsource the flights of UAVs. What they're doing is basically looking at dividing uh, Jakarta into different areas, and then you basically adopt, as a UAV pilot, you adopt an area, and it is then your responsibility when the flooding happens to safely, responsibly, and legally uh, capture high-resolution aerial imagery for your, for your signed-up uh, area. Very similar in a way to OpenStreetMap. In fact, there's a collaboration with OpenStreetMap where you can task uh, UAV pilots to capture aerial imagery. That's something that we're looking at actively. I think it's got huge uh, promise. Coming closer to Australia uh, just a few months ago, Category 5 cyclone, Cyclone Pan, devastated the islands of Vanuatu. And the World Bank I've uh, been working with and collaborating with has a UAVs for resilience program, for disaster resilience program. And what we did was activate the humanitarian UAV network to recruit and contract two uh, professional UAV teams to carry out aerial surveys of the disaster damage areas in order to complement the field-based surveys. So we ended up contracting two teams, one from Australia, Heli West, and the other from New Zealand, uh, XCraft. This is the XCraft team literally uh, an hour or two after we landed in Port Vila, uh, basically putting the, uh, quad the hexacopters together and, and calibrating um, these, uh, this technology. And you see the remote control here. That's really just, um, that's more for decoration. These UAVs are really flying robots. So you basically program the flight path and um, they do the rest. So it's actually quite boring after you've done all the programming uh, on the computer. This is one aerial image that I took just for demo purposes from, with my UAVs in, in Vanuatu. But what was interesting was although, although the World Bank had requested this imagery uh, in order to uh, identify damaged houses or partially damaged houses versus uh, fully destroyed houses, they just didn't have the capacity to analyze thousands and thousands of high resolution aerial imagery. They were already completely overstretched. So what we ended up doing was slicing up this imagery into micro images 
and pushing them to micromappers, because we had, uh, the year before, modified micromappers to crowdsource the tracing of high-resolution uh, aerial imagery. And you'll see that it's actually oblique imagery. It's imagery taken at an angle, not your typical satellite imagery, which is taken at a vertical or nadir uh, angle. And this is because we've seen from peer-reviewed studies and so on, that uh, oblique imagery is far more useful for disaster damage assessments. When you're looking at nadir imagery, vertical imagery, a lot of the damage can often be hidden, and so it's very difficult. In fact, it's incredible the work that Humanitarian Open Street Map does. Because they are limited to uh, nadir imagery, it's a lot, lot harder. And you can see the results uh, here. The red are basically houses that volunteers uh, deem to be fully destroyed, and orange is partially damaged, and so on. And it's just a matter of days. Over 6,000 very high-resolution aerial images were, were traced by these digital volunteers. And what we're doing now, this summer, with the university in Switzerland, the computer vision department, is taking the resulting data and seeing if we can teach an algorithm to recognize what disaster damage looks like in very high resolution oblique imagery. But even then here, I mean, you're still limited by the perspective. You don't, we don't know what those houses look like necessarily on the other side, which is why I think we're increasingly going to have to move to high resolution 3D models or 3D point clouds. And what you can do is I'm sure many um, Special experts in this room already know is you can use software that's been around for a few years already to basically convert two-dimensional aerial imagery into three-dimensional uh, point clouds. And this really gives you the advantage of being able to fly around and, um, and really inspect these, these, these houses from all angles. Another project that we're just starting now, which I haven't yet made public, is looking at um, basically live video feeds, uh, live streaming from UAVs and uh, crowdsourcing the analysis for the, of these live video feeds uh, to look for disaster damage assessments. So, so what you see in terms of the highlighting here is simply hundreds and hundreds of volunteers all clicking on areas of the video footage, of video feed where they see uh, what looks like uh, disaster damage. And it, what we do is we do some triangulation. Only if 80% or more of these volunteers are basically clicking in the same area do we highlight that area uh, in near real time, by the way. And what we want to do then is also train algorithms to recognize uh, disaster damage in real time based on this on this work. This is a, a, a 3D model based from uh, aerial imagery of post um, earthquake, uh, earthquake in Nepal. And here again, you can basically fly around and it's uh, almost game-like, right? What we want to do is crowdsource the analysis of these 3D models, annotate disaster damage, and, and hopefully get to a point where we can automatically identify disaster damage in 3D and why do we want to move to 3D? Well, because damage, disaster damage, is a 3D phenomenon. So to conclude, it isn't just about one uh, data source or, or one vector of information. It really is about the information stack. It's about combining crowdsourcing with artificial intelligence to make sense of various types of uh, data sources, from what you see here, uh, mainstream media, as well as the internet uh, of things, so that we can get to a point where we've integrated all these data sets and can visualize uh, disaster damage in, in real time by pulling from these different uh, data feeds. This is aerial footage of uh, Nepal. Where are we going from, with, with all this? Well, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, case study that I wrote and that I included in my book, Flight 370, that went missing last uh, March, about 230 uh, lost souls. And as you know, this really triggered the largest uh, search and rescue operation, and certainly the most expensive search and rescue operation in, in history, a multinational effort. Well, a few days into these efforts, when really no news was coming out, my colleagues at Digital Globe, at Tomnod, used their crowdsourcing platform to basically crowdsource the search for the missing aircraft, for oil slicks, for debris, for any kind of sign that would reveal where the, the aircraft might have, uh, might have crash landed. And the, resulting, uh, the, the result of this effort broke every single uh, record as far as crowdsourcing goes and still stands uh, today. Basically, eight million digital volunteers rallied online in order to search for those 230 lost souls. And together, uh, covered about a million square kilometers of satellite imagery footage. And by the way, 
This is not over a period of a few months. This is within 100 hours. 8 million people. That is the equivalent of uh, the population of Austria. So we're getting, forget crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is for kindergarten, right? This is like globe sourcing. This is nationwide sourcing where you can have the equivalent of an entire population of a country in Western Europe basically mobilized to look for 230 people. This brings up a bit of a challenge, however, because in uh, Nepal, about 8 million people were affected by the earthquake, but you had a few thousand digital volunteers mobilized to support the relief efforts. There's a real disconnect here. And so it often makes me think about, well, you know, should we always leave it up to the crowd? And this is where we do need policy interventions. And I really like what OpenStreetMap has done with Lee's group is basically saying, don't only focus on the disaster damage areas, but look at the outlying areas. We're gonna have to figure out this challenge and this tension earlier rather than later. So thank you very much.